Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armedian. In this hour, what exactly is an algorithm? And how does this technology govern society and political interactions? What biases persist in the use of these algorithms? Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. More and more of our lives are spent online. But perhaps even more importantly, more of our lives are determined by artificial intelligence and filtering systems that determine the information we receive, the framing of our worlds, and increasingly the products advertised to us. Frances Haugen, we now know her as the Facebook whistleblower, has revealed the extent to which that company is guided by its profit model and guided by a number of new technologies. And even a recent Hollywood kind of children's film, Space Jam, A New Legacy, placed as its villain, the algorithm. What are algorithms? How do they influence our lives? Are they perpetuating biases and discrimination in society? And are they having an influence, an impact on our democracy and on our representation? Today's panel explores these and other questions dealing with technology. We're joined today by Tina Iliasi Rod, Professor of Computer Science at Northeastern University. She is the author of Measuring Algorithmically Infused Societies and What Science Can Do for Democracy and Complexity Science Approach. Damian Patrick Williams, PhD candidate in the Department of Science, Technology and Society at Virginia Tech. He's the author of Why AI Research Needs Disabled and Marginalized Perspectives and Fitting the Description, Historical and Sociotechnical Elements of Facial Recognition and Anti-Black Surveillance. And Henning Schultzerina, Professor in the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University. He's the co-author of Mobility Protocols and Handover Optimization, Design, Evaluation, and Application and Building Communications and the Physical World and Future Internet's Escape the Simulator. He is also an Internet Hall of Fame innovator from 2013 and was the Chief Technology Officer for the United States Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, under the Obama administration. So let's start with you, uh, Professor Schulterina. We started off the algorithm was this villain in this movie, and we talk a lot about algorithms. But what is an algorithm? It's really actually quite simple. An algorithm is really just a sequence of steps and processes that we use to solve a problem. And I say we deliberately because we often think of algorithms as something that some machine learning or artificial intelligence system does. But we deploy, even though we don't call it, algorithms on a day-by-day -day basis. You can consider a recipe in a cookbook a classical form of an algorithm. It has ingredients, which would be roughly speaking the data uh, that we use in computer science uh, type of algorithms. And it has a sequence of steps uh, that we perform in order to hopefully arrive at a tasty meal. Uh, at that. And so the notion of an algorithm is an old one. It predates artificial intelligence, machine learning, indeed, uh, this is what a loan officer used to do when they manually approved a loan uh, long before this was delegated to a robot, if you want. And Professor Elias Irad, one of the big concerns about algorithms is that they seem to be kind of closed source, the sense that there's something making decisions that really aren't completely transparent. Is this an essential part of algorithms, this kind of lack of transparency, or can they be transparent? So there's a whole area of uh, folks who are studying transparency of, of algorithms, and there's nothing stopping algorithms being transparent. In fact, as was just mentioned, algorithms are just the recipe. So mandatory minimum sentencing is an, is an algorithm. Three strikes and you're out is an algorithm, right? It's very, very transparent. Um, the issue becomes that the algorithms that affect our lives these days use a lot of uh, the data that we're providing all the platforms, governments, organizations, etc. And then oftentimes those 
um, data are fed into algorithms that are black boxes. And some of your audience may have heard about deep learning or deep neural networks or um, deep fake videos, right? So all of the algorithms that use those are part of that technology are black boxes. We do not know what the algorithm is doing. Having said that, not all machine learning algorithms are black boxes. There are machine learning algorithms that are transparent and interpretable. That is, you can crack open the box and see exactly what the recipe is. Um, and, uh, but there is one slight caveat, if I may, if um, the company who is developing that algorithm, um, then that company um, won't release the, the algorithm. That's their secret sauce, right? And so then you don't know what they're using. You can try to audit it, right? And people are doing that too. The a whole group of people are also looking at auditing algorithms, like auditing Uber's algorithm in terms of pricing, auditing Amazon's algorithms. Um, but those algorithms are all closed to us in the public, even if they are interpretable within the company. And by the way, is that because it's, it's proprietary information? This is sort of industry secrets. And if, if they were to open that up, that would help their competitors. Yes, that is what they believe. Now, that doesn't mean that it's like um, state of the art by any mean. But yes, it is there. They don't want to say they could be using something very simple. Um, like a regression that's been around for a very long time, which is I just have certain features and I want to weigh them differently and I'll learn how to weigh them differently with data. But yes, it's their secret sauce. They don't want to release it to their mm. competitors. Yeah, Maybe we could just add to that, if I may. Yeah. Namely, one of the things that has changed, even though I said earlier that when algorithms clearly have been around long before a concern about AI and machine learning and deep neural networks and all that, is that many of these newer algorithms are much more adaptive than the old ones. So what you had, come on, think of a credit score, a classical high impact algorithm, which is opaque in a sense that I have no idea which numbers go into my credit score. Am I, uh, and none of the credit bureaus will tell me. They're not using, maybe now, but they certainly weren't using any AI before, but the algorithm was probably relatively stable. So they could theoretically release that to certainly a regulator. They could show that to somebody informed at the regulator, at a financial services regulator, and they could prove that, let's say, sensitive facts, say gender, race, are not factored into that. But what they couldn't Today, the algorithms often are, particularly the better ones, they learn over time. So that the algorithm that I experience today isn't the same, even though the basic machinery is not changed, is that the weights on the deep, deep neural networks, which essentially combine these inputs into a decision, they're not the same today as they were yesterday. So saying I'm disclosing the algorithm is meaningless because that discloses what happened last week. It doesn't disclose what happens tomorrow. And uh, they also are much more amenable, these type of algorithms, for incorporating new data sources. So in particular, old algorithms were generally pretty dumb in terms of number of data sources. And as was just mentioned, you now have this problem that you have much more data that you can all feed in. Much of it is essentially ignored as if you were to look under the hood of the algorithm, uh, but you don't really know which of these thousands of data points actually influence the algorithm. And so it's the transparency is often much harder to accomplish, even if you were to specify, yep, we're looking at these thousand data points, most of them probably have almost no influence in it or under only very peculiar small set of circumstances. So. And uh, Damien Williams, I know you've done research into some of the different biases that have been built into algorithms. Are the current use of algorithms reproducing the racial biases that we see in society? Not just the racial biases, but the gendered biases, the, uh, you know, 
biases towards uh, you know, sexuality, biases towards you know, the nature of gender and sexuality, the nature of uh, health and disability. Uh, all of these biases are instantiated within these systems. And that's because you know, we should be very careful about something here. Biases are perspectives, right? And the biased perspectives are perspectives. They're, they're the perspectives of the human beings who you know, collected this data, who uh, organized the data regime under which data was to be collected in the first place, let alone how it was then to be trained into the systems themselves. Um, and human beings swim in a sea of the perspectives and influences of the values and cultures of other human beings. We are at all times products of perspectives and biases. So yeah, we have these biases instantiated within these systems because how could we not? You know, we built them. We made them, and so they are definitely going to have us within them. The only way we could ever even possibly get a clearer sense of these things is, you know, as Professor Schultzwinner was saying, you know, just having the transparency of the what factors are being considered doesn't doesn't in any way get to where we need to be. Knowing how transformations are taking place, knowing what kinds of weights are being given at the outset, what ways it's being trained to operationalize those different weightings, those different considerations, the kinds of preferences it's been told to give to certain types of data. That's the kind of thing that allows us to have a fuller picture. And even then, you know, we're talking about so many thousands of points of data, so many thousands of types of operations, so many different values and beliefs and perspectives that have been embedded from the people who have built the data set, the people who have done the training, the people who have built the algorithm and told it to operate in different ways, that at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about a ridiculously difficult set of operations, but it's also deeply crucial that we start to think of it in terms of how difficult it is and to think about in terms of what is at stake in the operations of these procedures and these algorithms. So there are lots of excellent points there. So one, in fact, there is a website called the Library of Missing Data Sets, where you know, we have lots of data for the privileged folks in our communities uh, and our societies, but not on the marginalized folks. And then the other aspect of it is most of the algorithms that you um, were talking about up front are being trained on data that's available publicly on the internet. So there was a lot of media around these large language models like BERT or GPT-3, where, oh my gosh, we have passed the Turing test, we have strong AI, right? I type in two Muslims walk into a bar and it completes the rest, right? The problem is that it's being trained on data that's on the internet, it's not curated. So if you type two Muslims walk into a bar, it says, and they blow it up. Right. And in fact, there was a recent paper that was shown that this data that they are using is full of uh, language that is misogynistic, uh, racist, uh, Islamophobia, all kinds of things. And so there are issues around this data that was really nicely mentioned, um, but it doesn't end with the data, uh, but it is a big part, just the data and what they're using. Yeah, and uh, this is Damien again, uh, to, to continue along that vein, this is something that we've known about going back to, you know, thinking about word to vec operations, thinking about, you know, natural language programming as a whole, um, the, the effects of the Enron corpus on natural language programming models has been studied a great deal at this point. And the fact that, you know, when you have a group of people who in their private communications are using highly sexist and otherwise bigoted language to have conversations about the acts of, uh, you know, large scale economic fraud that they're committing. And then you use those communications as the training data and the training framework for natural language models that you're going to embed within those models some very problematic things. And to think that that wouldn't be the case to somehow not consider that that would end up being the case in the first place is astounding. And then we can talk about Tay and Microsoft's massive failures with Tay, and then a, a exactly a year later with Zoe, you know, the, 
the failures of, of letting these systems loose on the internet with no guidance and no restriction and then being somehow shocked that they came back racist and misogynistic and bigoted. Like yeah. I'm and, sorry, and but Twitter's I, a cesspool. Indeed. <laughs> and one of the things which is interesting is that this is not just on the social data. So I just wanted to make a point. So for example, oximeters, where we were all wanting to buy oximeters to measure the amount of oxygen in our blood. There was all this news about, oh, these oximeters don't work on darker skin people because of the technology that they use. Well, this was known way back in the 80s, but nobody did anything. And now all of that data is being fed into algorithms that are being used in medicine. And so there, there is this notion of who's privileged in our society and who's not. And so the algorithms mimic the privileged, work for the privileged, not for the folks that are marginalized. If you listen to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org, we're discussing the impact of technology, particularly of algorithms, with Tina Eliasi Rod of Northeastern University, Damian Patrick Williams of Virginia Tech, and Henning Schultzerna of Columbia University. And Henning, then, it makes me think ultimately what we're really talking about, what's made algorithms such a fascinating and such a potentially obtrusive part of our lives is the management of the massive amount of data that's now being collected. First, is it fair to say we're collecting more data than ever before and that the algorithms are basically ways in which that we're trying to manage this massive amount of data with all of the potential biases because we're the ones doing the managing of the data? Yeah, I'm going to be following on under the previous discussion. I think it's helpful to look at why we actually use these systems. So and some of it is just because we can. Some of the examples were mentioned. It's just cool to do that stuff with often predictably, unpredictably bad result, but maybe not as harmful as others might be. And the others is there is a sense that existing systems are insufficiently efficient. So I mentioned early on the loan officer model. Uh, the financial services industry has an interest in getting rid of loan officers. Well, needless to say, those were hardly unbiased algorithms either. Uh, well, it's not like these were the paragons of racial and gender neutrality in that. So they, well, there is a concern and a legitimate concern that many of these manual techniques had their own issues and they often had from a management perspective issue that you get these kind of very embarrassing things that real estate agents steer their clients in certain ways that you find out later, at least if you run the algorithm, if you're at least careful, you might have a little bit more control over that than these pesky independent real estate agents that act in ultra human ways. But what I wanted to emphasize is a different way to maybe to think about it. Namely, one is that many of the highest impact algorithms are really designed to, from a for people who run those to prevent bad things happening. There's a very high risk of somebody uh, not repaying their loan, they lose all of that money as a bank. There's somewhat of a high risk of admitting students to a program uh, that don't complete. That makes me look as an institution, since we all are affiliated with like Deca and institutions, all of our, those institutions want to have high graduation rates. That makes us look good in the rankings. And so many of these, the highest uh, kind of risk algorithms from a human perspective are the ones that are essentially designed to mitigate institutional risk, not make bad loans, not admit unqualified students, not to uh, release uh, defendants who probably shouldn't be released, all of those. And what's really hard is leaving aside kind of just what you might call um, ignorance, stupidity, or worse, is that it's often very difficult to do a, well, what happens if I make some different decision? I can't admit a different set of students. I can't necessarily release a different set of people after booking them. I can't make different loans for the same people and see what happens. So often the difficult part is even figuring out is there a better algorithm that I could have used and maybe should have used in that um, is hard 
leaving aside that there's some many low hanging fruits of those identified where we clearly should have done as a community collectively as a computer science and public policy community, as in somebody should have said, hey, in like 1980s, we know this, this is not something that uh, we need to reproduce every time. We, we know better by now, but the, the harder questions are the ones is, what do you do for cases where running alternatives is just hard? Tina, you want to speak? If I may follow up on that, one of the issues is that when people use algorithms, they believe that the algorithm is somehow objective. And in fact, when algorithms are being used in, for example, criminal justice, it seems like they're being used as expert systems, but they're not being treated as expert systems. So when I get called to a court as an expert, they ask me, why are you an expert? You know, and I need to prove that I am an expert versus these algorithms are being used and no questions are asked. And then recently, Cesar Hidalgo wrote this great book. Um, that came out at MIT Press called How Humans Judge Machines, where he looked at it from the psychology perspective. And when harm is done by a machine, people don't assign intent to that machine. But when harm is done by a human, they assign intent to that human, where that machine came from somewhere. Somebody made that machine. For some reason, intent does not transfer through the machine. And so we don't have accountability, right? So if the Arnold Foundation's public safety assessment tool is used and I wrongly am sent to jail where I should have been released uh, while I wait for my um, day in court, who, who's to blame? Who, you know, like if I bring something like a toaster to my house and it burns my house down, I can sue the toaster company. And those are things that we're still working through. And of course, the law is very slow. Yeah, to follow on there as well, I would just like to say, you know, there's the the fact of certain areas having been known for even longer than the 80s. Um, you know, we were talking about the oximeters, but we can go as far back as the spirometer, right? Um, spirometry and the measurement of breath uh, has a, a long history of racialized bias, and yet it still exists in, you know, we're talking. 1800s uh, measurements of breath uh, that have persisted to uh, the technologies that we use to do so today. And, and we're talking about the fact that there are graduating classes of, of doctors right now who still have the belief that Black people have a higher tolerance for pain than white people. Like this is as of, you know, a report as of 2019, <laughs> that this is an extant belief. In, in medical practitioners, um, something that has been debunked and, and was thought to have been demystified long hence. Um, there's, a, there's a quote by uh, Dr. Debbie Chatra, works at Olin College, um, and it's kind of an updating of Arthur Clarke's law. Uh, it goes, any sufficiently advanced neglect is indistinguishable from malice. And so if you know for long enough that there has been a lacuna or multiple lacunae, <laughs> that there has been uh, something raised to the attention of the public often by those who've been harmed by it, and it hasn't been done anything about, even if the intent to harm is not there, that doesn't change the fact that the harm persists and is amplified and iterated upon in whole hosts of new ways. Mm. Damien, if I can follow up then, because um, one of the themes here is that we've known about some of these limitations and we've known about this, um, uh, we've known about these challenges. Why haven't there been improvements in these areas? You said, we haven't done anything to improve this. Why? Well, it kind of goes back to something that Professor Elias Arad said earlier. Um, these things are treated as objective, right? we talk about math and we talk about code as if they are um, objective tools or tools that allow us to remove uh, subjective perspectives from the work that we are doing. If it is instantiated in mathematics, if it's instantiated in code, then it is read to be by the external world and by many non-experts and even experts who make use of them as objective fact. Um, when the fact of the matter is that those, again, those codes were written by someone, as we've all said at multiple points today, these codes were created by humans. 
the perspectives of those humans have made their way into those codes, even in ways that people do not expect or suspect. There's a practice within um, social sciences known as bias bracketing, right? And it kind of gets at a lot of what we're talking about here. It's the process of being able to look your biases, your perspectives, your, your habits of thought, you know, examine them and ask yourself the question, do I make this decision because it is the right decision or the, the most likely decision in general? Or do I make this decision because it is my habit, because it is the perspective that I have, because it is the expectation of the world and the pattern that I seek to fit? At present, no algorithm can fully bracket its own biases. No system can truly examine itself for the biases that it has, the patterns and habits of thought and ask itself, did I go down this path because I went this way, because it was the most likely outcome, or because it was the most likely outcome I was told to expect, to look for. Along those lines, which is very interesting. So I, I teach this um, undergraduate course to first year um, students about um, algorithms that affect lives. And the students are amazing. And they are like, is there a tool that I can use that will tell me how I'm being manipulated on these sites, on Twitter, on Facebook, etc.? We do not have that tool that will tell you as the user how you're being manipulated. Like if I click on this link versus that link, what would happen? Or there's all this money that's going into explainable AI. And in some of these platforms, they have these question marks that you can click on, like, why am I seeing this ad? And the explanations are so broad. I am showing you this because you're a female between 18 and 65 and you live in the US. Well, that's clearly not exactly it. And then there are others that are just like demographics, right? So I have a friend who's a female after she turned 30, she was uh, shown all these Facebook ads about losing weight because clearly after 30, you wanna lose weight if you're female in America. The only way she could get rid of it was to go into Facebook and change her profile um, gender to male. And then she got all these other kinds of ads that she didn't want to see, right? So, so there's all this other background stuff that's happening that we do not see. You know, Facebook has two books on each person. There's the one you tell them and people lie all the time. And then what they infer about you based on your activity. And Henning, please. So just to maybe so to say, complicate things a little bit is one of the problems that we have is it is often quite difficult to, well, besides a general notion, to define bias in of it itself. So, for example, is because of the risk mitigation of many of the highest impact algorithms is, well, what, what do you do uh, if the algorithm uh, is both racially biased and defective? Uh, in that. I mean, those have a hard ones. It's the easy one, relatively speaking, let's assume that uh, we want to, uh, to fix the, well, race shouldn't be to take it, or gender shouldn't be play a role, but for whatever reasons, it does. I mean, and then I mean, this sounds bad for loans, but we know that certain diseases are clearly gender specific and have racial biases of the side that we can't fix. And so they should be declaring those, uh, incorporating those. I might observe ones because they have a biological basis uh, in, uh, in that particular case. So my maybe answer the earlier question a little bit is that we have uh, my two incentive problems. Clearly commercial entities that sell these things have no interest to uh, declare that mind, you shouldn't pay attention to what I just sold you for lots of money. Mind, that's just not a winning sales proposition. Uh, in that. I mean, you should basically not trust what I sold you uh, in that. And the second part is uh, related to that, that evaluating that objectively is extremely difficult for third parties. I can, leaving Volkswagen shenanigans aside, I can take a car to a test station and see how much CO2 it emits. And I don't have to understand in detail how the engine works. Uh, it's really difficult to do that with algorithms in the same way. Like I said, they change, uh, if nothing else. And they depend strongly on the data and the quality of the data, which was mentioned earlier. 
And even academics, not to excuse ourselves, is I think there has been a fascination with the promises of machine learning and AI in particular. Uh, and not, I mean, this is, after all, a sustenance of many uh, graduate students and faculty. And so until recently, until biases and AI become a research topic in and of itself, is there has not been a whole lot of incentive to point out that this doesn't work nearly as well in that. Again, that's not a good way to get your paper accepted uh, in that, if, even if you take that. Uh, it's been usually one of, you take a data set that you have, you try to sh improve a performance in some way, and that works relatively well for certain things that doesn't work really all that well for that. And I mean, Academics don't usually have access to much of the high impact data. I mean, there's a reason that facial recognition has been studied pretty well in terms of its academic I mean, its bias. And that's not because it's necessarily the largest problem. Again, I would argue that many of other things that we've discussed have higher impact, uh, leaving criminal justice facial recognition aside for a moment. But it is because the data sets were available uh, you could make these, uh, you could conduct the research, and it was relatively uh, incontrovertible that you had these failures. So it was the easy one to find, not necessarily the one that is the most prominent or even the highest impact. Damien, we've been describing quite a bit of the bias the challenges, the you know, the ways in which these the algorithms are producing, in many ways, sort of reproducing biases from those who are doing the coding, reproducing the biases within society. But there's there's been a bit of a backlash, hasn't there? And the, the example I want to cite here is in California in 2020, we had a proposition on the ballot to eliminate a clearly biased system. It was the bail system that clearly has a racial and most significantly a class-based bias from people being held. And the proposal was to replace the bail system with an algorithm. And the algorithm would determine whether or not accused would be released. It was rejected, largely because even though we all knew that the bail system is horrifically biased, the concern was is the algorithm was also biased and maybe more so. So how much are these biases kind of well known and we're seeing these political social reactions already you know you know to the bias as heading indicated before the break one of the things that we have noticed is that it's been increasingly so over the past several years right since around uh 2014 2015 the notion of algorithmic bias has become a component of the public awareness in uh, an ever increasing fashion right we wouldn't be able to have these conversations as widely as we're having them even you know six seven years ago um it as recently as 2019 uh, i was at a conference on in, on artificial intelligence in Stanford amongst a host of artificially intelligent experts. And they, uh, these artificial intelligence experts did not want to confront the fact two years ago, did not want to confront the fact that the idea of how data was constructed, how math was manipulated could have cultural roots and implications. They wanted to treat these operations from top to bottom as neutral. So it's changing. The backlash is increasing. And some of that has to do with a lot of kind of high profile, um, well, scandals from Facebook to Google to Amazon's recognition system. Um, the ACLU has made a very big deal about uh, the American Civil Liberties Union. They've made a very big deal about the fact that Amazon's recognition system uh, has massively misidentified prominent members of public society in the United States, right? They did a, a, a facial recognition test on 28 members of Congress, and it misidentified every dark-skinned member of Congress, and then tagged many of them as criminals within a mugshot database. So that kind of got people's attention. <laughs> and since then, People have been talking about it more. People have been thinking about it more. Um, the, the big paper from Georgetown uh, in 2016 called The Perpetual Lineup it was this huge, hundreds of page long investigation of facial recognition and the implications thereof. Facebook recently, Facebook previously, Facebook sentiment manipulation survey in 2013. There's like, all of these things have been more and more and more in the public mind. So the backlash has been building. 
And I think that the backlash has gotten to a point where if you give people the opportunity to say, we're going to get rid of cash bail, great. Cash bail is racist and classist. Fantastic. Get rid of it. Wait, you're going to replace it with an algorithmic bail recommendation system that's been trained on the racist and classist operations of the previous system. That doesn't seem better. <laughs> People now have a little bit more of an understanding to be able to make that case in public. And so you also have things like Google firing, you know, Tim Nick and Brew, um, you know, their, their entire AI ethics research team, because the determinations that the team made in the course of their research were like, hey, if you keep using these large language models, you're going to have a massively outsized environmental impact. You're going to do terrible, unethical, and unjust things that will have an outsized impact on the other end. We should stop doing that. And the response that you know the company has to that is to fire the team. That made news. <laughs> that, that kind of struck some nerves. Uh, as more and more people are concerned about the impacts of our technologies on climate, you know, to, to see something that prominent, that high profile happen, it made people upset. Uh, so that backlash is increasing. It's getting to the point where more and more people have the tools to be able to make these kinds of calls. Tina, you want to speak to the backlash? Yeah, so a couple of things. So so Tim Nick Gibru was resignated, uh, at least there because um, Google says she resigned. And so, so now, now there's this term that she was resignated. And then Meg Mitchell, who was her colleague, was fired. But this gets into the incentive structure. Like, what are the incentives of, for example, the judge that's using the algorithm? Is it for efficiency? Is it for accuracy? What are, what are the incentives, especially when these algorithms are being used in high stakes um, decisions? Um, and what are the incentives of the academics? Like as, as Henning was saying, it seems to me that the academics are like, oh, this is a new area I can publish in, right? And we pat ourselves on the back that we're moving science forward. In the meantime, these algorithms are being used on marginalized people and are causing harm to them. Now there are people who actually care about the incentive structure and are doing it correctly. One of them is Rahid Ghani at um, Carnegie Mellon University, where he started the movement of data science for social good. And he would actually have graduate students go out with cops and go out with ambulance drivers to see what is actually happening and how data is being collected and, and just the whole learning more about society, which gets me to um, Sophia Noble's quotation. I really like uh, what she says, which is you have no business the, um, uh, designing algorithms for society when you know nothing about society. So what you have is a bunch of privileged stem people designing algorithms for everybody it's like designing a bridge for only the privileged people the bridge will only work for the privileged people it will not work if you happen to be marginalized and it's like that is not okay right and so there are there is now this movement that look we have to have specifications for these algorithms and if the algorithm doesn't meet the specification, then the algorithm should not be used. Or at least the algorithm should have some warning labels, right? The algorithm is like drugs. It's like prescription drugs. You should have something that will cause some doubt in the judge's mind, as opposed to on a scale of zero to 10, Tina is eight, right? Um, they, they don't say that the algorithm is uncertain. I understand that communicating uncertainty is difficult, but you should at least say that the algorithm is not sure. The algorithm is perhaps only 50% sure or 80% sure or 75% sure, but they don't do that. So the incentive structures are, for lack of a better phrase, messed up. And Henning? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to just maybe say, that my, I don't think it's sufficient to just say we shouldn't use algorithms because generally speaking that we have done this in primitive forms for since computers were around, or even really before that, just human operated ones uh, in that. Um, and so, and just simply say, well, humans should make a decision. We all know that doesn't necessarily yield better results, uh, particularly harried, overworked humans who have to make decisions. I, well, we know the studies from Israel where the result of your, your sentence depended on whether the judge had lunch or not. Uh, that hardly seems an improvement um, over an algorithm. In that. I, 
what I do think is a notion, and this has really been a development in other areas of computer science as well, is we had related, they're different, we didn't have a kind of a societal effects in user interfaces and in security, where initially people primarily did technology, and then only belatedly and often with a decade or so late, we recognized that, hey, this, are, this user interface is actually not usable by people who uh, don't have a kind of a 2020 vision or who have perfect hearing or who, are, uh, who have color blindness or whatever else happens to be. And for security itself, we all know how my usable security became a, my, a more of a concern given that it failed otherwise. So to be more, to try to be constructive in the sense that there's really, what I'd say, two general directions that one might pursue. Namely, one is to identify uh, high consequence algorithms that have kind of high risks associated with them, as opposed to just say all algorithms bad, we can't be used, all that. That's not going to, it's not going to be particularly helpful is, and we do that elsewhere. We say we have machinery that is particularly dangerous. We regulate construction equipment differently than, um, I don't know, a scooter or something. And so because the damage it can do is different. So research prototypes don't have to photo, I mean, have to follow the same rules as something which is used by, say, the FBI to track down defendants. Uh, so and we need to be cognizant that I mean, just removing algorithms such as facial recognitions have cost uh, that I mean, are born also by people uh, in that, defendants that otherwise would be imprisoned and should be or not uh, in that. And we need to be honest about that. It is, I don't think helpful to simply say, well, we won't use algorithm X to do something and that will have no cost whatsoever. Uh, in that it will just remove bias uh, in that. And that is, I don't think that's, a, that's an argument that is sustainable. And we see that in political sphere that that argument won't be sustained because people justifiably or not, they want to be perceived security or safety or uh, economic risk mitigation that algorithms promise and maybe even achieve in some very imperfect way. If I may just clarify, it is not about not using algorithms, but it's about when an algorithm causes harm, who is accountable, right? If, if an automated vehicle kills somebody, who's accountable? Is the company accountable? Who's driving that automated vehicle, right? It's really about accountability and our laws are not there. So the question is, and this is what Timnit Gibru recently um, said in an interview in, in the Wired magazine, is to slow down. Let's figure out who is accountable when an algorithm causes harm. Absolutely, let's use algorithm. I built my career on building algorithms, right? Um, but who is accountable? Right now, I am not accountable. I can release something and people can get harmed and nothing. Absolutely, in fact, now in the age of democratization of data science, I can get some money, do what the Clearview AI guy did, right? Go and scrape images from the internet download PyTorch that does image recognition and cause harm to people. And it's like ethics, ethics what, right? And that's what we're talking about. It's not about not using algorithms. It's about first building the accountability scaffold because it causes harm to real people. Mm. Uh, they just happen to be marginalized. Maybe we don't care about their marginalized people. And then let's just be honest about it, mm. right? We don't care about these marginalized people. I don't care, I'm causing them harm. I would like a policy person to say that to my face. And we're like, okay, great. Absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. So. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. We're discussing algorithms and their impacts on multiple populations, particularly at marginalized populations, with Tina Eliassi Rod of Northeastern University, Damian Williams of Virginia Tech, and Henning Schultzerna of Columbia University. And Damian, we acknowledge that algorithms can reproduce bias and actually can enforce bias. Can we produce algorithms that can identify the bias that other algorithms have? Can we use technology to address the bias within technology? And if we're not doing that, I guess a, a decision that Tina just sort of raised that people who are designing the algorithms can do it if they want, if it's a priority. 
I mean, that's exactly it. So first and foremost, we have to, you know, recognize again, as we talked about at the kind of the outset here, biases perspective, biases point of view. If you want to be very careful and attentive about exactly which types of biases you're building in, that's fine and good. And as part of the slowed down, carefully intentional process of building these systems to exactly the specification of which values we want to build in. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about the values of the society of the people who build these systems, the culture of the people who build these systems, the culture of the people who ask for these systems, the cultures of the people who deploy these systems. All of these values and cultures are at play throughout every step of this process. So if we wanted to do the work of saying, okay, I wanna be able to identify prejudicial biases. I wanna be able to identify marginalizing and minoritizing biases. We can do that. We can teach a system how to recognize those patterns at play to see how they come about, to see how they crop up. But we're going to have to reframe a lot of values and we're going to have to reframe a lot of what we think of as knowledge and data in the first place. So much of what's happening here is unexplored, unexamined perspectives and assumptions about what counts as knowledge, what counts as evidence, what counts as data, right? When we talk about disability benefits. When we talk about how, you know, ableism gets built into technological systems, the core ideas behind so much of the disability benefits determinations in the United States and elsewhere come from the 18 and 1700s models of what it means to be disabled, what it means to be a disabled person in the world. And they are about institutionalization. They're about care from a particular type of source. They have no understanding of care within the community, of disabled models of care, of techno science in terms of how we think about what it means to be a disabled person in league with technology. All of these things are instantiated throughout the long course of being disabled and being on benefits. So when we talk about the idea of like determining which realms of harm are pertinent, right? Like we have to think about the fact that some of these aren't even considered realms of harm. Disabled people have been trying to like wave our arms and say, hey, look over here <laughs> for, for decades. And people are going, no, you're fine. We, we've determined what works for you. And we'll make these determinations for you. Don't worry about it. Without doing the work to kind of disentangle this, to bring in knowledge holders, and lived experiential experts as part of the process, not just as like survey data to mine, not just as like respondents to fit to, but as part of the planning process, part of the design process. It's not just about the data sets and who's included within them because you can include a widely diverse data set and then still use that in a wholly prejudicial manner. But unless they're brought in as part of the process of building and designing from the outset, we're lost. We will be back in the same situation, but with a more capable discriminatory system, a, cap a system more capable of being discriminatory. Indeed. And in fact, there are people who have been um, talking about this since the mid 1990s. For example, Helen Nissenbaum had a paper with Friedman about bias in computer systems. It's just that people didn't pay attention to it. And in fact, in terms of this particular area of AI and ethics, if I may uh, paint it with a big brush, um, I see it as basically two camps. There are the marginalized people who work in this area and they say, look, it's causing harm. It's causing harm. It's causing harm. We need to like slow down, figure out what's going on. And then there's the privileged people who are like, oh, we're, we're advancing science. We, we keep patting ourselves on the back. We're advancing science. And so there is this this difference between the privileged people and the marginalized people. And in particular, like when we teach our graduate students, especially like when I teach master's students, right? They just want to know the algorithms that will get them a very high paying job, which is a very narrow way of thinking about it, because you can get that high paying job, then you can design a social technical system that could get an administration or well, we don't know exactly the causal links, but it could be correlated with an administration coming to power that is against immigration. There goes your H1B visa. You are part of society. So when I go and give talks at my conferences, the CS conferences, computer science, machine learning conferences, and I say, who would want their algorithm to be used on themselves? Nobody raises their hand, not even the privileged person. 
raises the hand that I'm okay with my algorithm being used on me in these high settings, right? You go to jail or not. Nobody raises their hand. It tells you something about what the culture of the people who are designing the algorithms is. And Henning, please. Just on a kind of more practical side, I think we've been talking about two domains really, namely what you might call the academic and research domain, where we actually have at least a potential tool set, namely institutional review boards that were indeed instituted for a purpose after some I mean, uh, horrific medical experiments and others to deal with a particular failure of uh, I mean, in a sense, there were two failures, namely one of bad people being allowed to, and I'm using bad in quotation marks, but I mean, people who really didn't care uh, or were actively malicious doing horrific things. But more importantly, since that's unfortunately a relatively small fraction of people, people who wanted to do better but didn't know any better uh, in that. In a sense, they didn't know what questions to ask. And so on the academic research side, I think we're making some progress, but need to make more on that these models of institutional review of third parties who are not vested in the paper publication and so on, uh, get involved early in addressing, when did you do a good job collecting your data? Uh, is, was it collected ethically? D uh, did you uh, check your results? Uh, I, for I, my applicability, did you state your limitations correctly? Those type of things. And then the high stakes implementations, which are largely done outside the academic world, but where the academic world could have, if it does it well, a role to play and indeed um, a regulatory institution that we have not really talked about. They need to have the tools to be able to review these decisions, again, outside of a conflicted entity. They should be able to go in without having to beg vendors for and please give me access. It just should be part of a review that is done regularly to make sure that the algorithm performs in the way that it should have, and maybe to look for potential failure cases, even at the edges, cases at certain edge cases, which are not handled, kind of the, the driving model, or systemic and systematic um, ones. And we need to, man, these, you shouldn't be able to deploy an algorithm that is not observable in its output. If you do that, you're uh, again, you just like you don't run an airplane without a flight recorder, we need a algorithm recorder so that outside parties can go back and say, what actually happened here? And assume that many of the people want to do the right things, not just earn money, but actually don't have the tools to know what the consequences of it decisions or non-decisions happen. And Damien Williams, we have about 90 seconds left. So I'll give you the last word with this, which is, it seems like part of this is a clarion call that we need more voices making these decisions, more diverse voices making these decisions. Suggestions on how we get there? Yeah, thank you. And yes, that's exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about who's in the room. We're talking about whose knowledge is heated. We're talking about who is understood to be an expert in their their field, their experience, the, the kinds of questions they think of to ask. As Henning was just saying, you know, some people don't know what questions they need to be asking, but there are people who do know. Heed them, because we're not silent, obviously. We're out here, we're trying to tell you these are the questions that need to be being asked. Find the people who have been excluded from these conversations. Think to ask at the very outset, at the very least, who isn't in this room? who is excluded from this conversation and then find those voices and preference those voices but don't just use them as tokens bring them in and let them build teams mm -hmm. give them authority give them power within the process i always say sort of drawing on this that the stem fields can teach us how to build an al algorithm or i always say the stem fields can teach us that we can create jurassic park 
Social sciences tell us the impact that's going to have on society, and the humanities tell us whether it's a good idea. And we need to have those conversations jointly. Thank you all for a really wonderful conversation on this increasingly important issue. We've been discussing the impact of algorithms on society, on biases within the on marginalized communities, and the best ways to ask the right questions about these impacts. Our panel today has been Tina Eliassi Rod, Professor of Computer Science at Northeastern University. She's the author of Measuring Algorithmic Infused Societies and What Science Can Do for Democracy, a Complexity Science Approach. Damian Patrick Williams, PhD candidate in the Department of Science, Technology, and Society at Virginia Tech. He's the author of Why AI Research Needs Disabled and Marginalized Perspectives and Fitting the Description, Historical and Sociotechnical Elements of Facial Recognition and Anti-Black Surveillance. And Henning Schilterina, professor in the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University. He's the co-author of Mobility Protocols and Handover Optimization design, evaluation, and application, and bridging communications and the physical world and future internets escape the simulator. He is an internet hall of fame innovator from 2013 and was the chief technology officer for the U.S.'s Federal Communications Commission under the Obama administration. Thank you. And that's it for today's program. Thank you for listening. The Scholar Circle is hosted by Doug Becker. Its managing producers are Ankina Agassian and Melissa Chiprin. Sad Dongre is our webmaster and assistant producer. Our archives are at scholarcircle.org, and our podcasts are on Apple and Google Podcasts and iTunes. Please follow us on at Scholar Circle or me at Armudian and join our Facebook page. I'm the founder, anchor, and occasional host, Maria Armudian. <laughs>